Um, so thank you for being here. I'm very happy to introduce Vitya Wusu to you. And I'm not going to say much more than that he is a designer. And he will explain himself what, what his interests are and, and what kind of research he's pursuing. Um, he promised me that he's compressed a three hour presentation into one hour. Mm -hmm. He really wants to you will stick within that hour so we have time for questions and answer afterwards. So join me in welcome. Yep. So, yeah, sure. Thank you. So, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, so, I'm Gauthier Roussel. I'm a French designer. Uh, I'm here today with high stakes. Uh, I want it w it's going to be like a very dense presentation. So there's a lot to talk about, but I will try to, to make it as easy as I can. And uh, if you have any questions at some point, just ask me. And I will ask you uh, uh, from time to time. So it will be kind of an audio for you today. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, at the end, I just want you to remember that at some point, a French dude with a strong accent came and asked you what, how to think about your practice and how to think what you want to live in the future. Uh, through your practice and through what you are as a being. So it's six big points. Uh, it will be a quick introduction about what I'm doing. Uh, ethics and politics, I, I know some of you had a, had a course on that, so I will quite be brief on that. I will introduce you with the concept of Anthropocene, if some of you don't, have, uh, don't know how to associate this world with. Uh, after that, so it will be kind of the big part of the presentation, which are the core issues of design regarding transition, which is kind of my research, which is kind of my work and my topic. And then we're going to try to open up on how can we do it di uh, differently through design, knowing all the key points we've been seeing so far, and then we'll be concluding. So yeah, it's a dense talk. I'm going to talk about economy, design, uh, politics, philosophy. So take a comfortable position, take a deep breath, full attention. So uh, it's just one side about me and then we're gonna throw that away. So uh, I've been running a design, design studio in France for four years, uh, co-running. Uh, just re it, it was basically four years to understand that. I didn't really like to run the company. It's not, I like to do accounting, it's, super, uh, it's fine. I was also directing uh, other design research projects. We were doing a lot of design fiction, trying to, to pursue the limits of design. And there is a lot of them to, uh, to, look, at, to look for. But at the end, I was not really into it. Uh, it didn't add a lot of meaning with the clients we had. And it was interesting, but not fulfilling. Then my uh, business partner and I we decided <coughs> to split. We decided to, uh, to go in, in our own direction each. So I've been, when we split it, I decided to direct and produce a documentary called Ethics for Design, which basically I've been uh, touring Europe, meeting with researchers, designers, and all, all kind of profiles from every kind of practices to ask them about their own responsibility and how they define their practice regarding ethics. So it's been basically six months of me doing, res six months uh, doing research about ethics, which was very interesting because I've been just traveling, thinking about ethics, then doing editing, post-production, basically six months of dense ethics work which are the consequences to make me formulate my own ethics, which is a very, which is some, a luxury as a designer to do so. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, I've been also being a speaker and teacher about ethics and no more in sustainability and Anthropocene, which is kind of my research right now. Uh, it's very, very annoying for me to be a speaker because I always think that I'm not legitimate to speak which is kind of a design thing anyway. Um, but I, very, I like very much to do teaching. It's kind of my thing. So I hope I will demonstrate it tonight. Or at least as a speaker, not as a teacher. Uh, and so now I've been doing uh, a condensed master in London, in Goldsmiths University, which I've been finishing recently. And if everything goes according to the plan, I will be doing a PhD by practice in design in Paris, located in Paris, and doing field research in China. So just to give a, a small 
This one talk about what is the documentary we've been doing, so FX for design. So it's an uh, interactive documentary, which is free, uh, open source, and under Creative Commons. So everybody can use it for free, as long as it's not for commercial use. So for, for from the many people I've been interviewing during the documentary, there is James Auger, that some of you might know for critical design or speculative design. And he was that, I think he was uh, working in the Royal College of Art for 10 years in the design interaction department. So this kind of extract sum, sums up what I was trying to do with the documentary. It's the only way we can practice responsible design, I think, is through understanding the complexity of the world in which we're operating. The problem with design at the moment, it reduces that complexity, it simplifies it, it makes it banal, because it has this very, very simple goal of making good products. Define good is the problem. Design better is the problem. And I think this is the problem with design. It's got a very naive view of what is good and what is preferable. So, yeah, that was kind of, I was trying to, uh, to look with this documentary, which is basically, what does it mean to do good design? And eventually, it's, it's not a question that we have to answer. That's, that's a question we have to ask permanently, but never to answer. And I think that's kind of some of what ethics can be to some e in design to some extent. And at the end also, what is your responsibility as a designer? Whatever you will make, whatever you will produce as a product, as a services, as service, what does your respons responsibility extend to the user, to the system in which it operates? That was kind of the other things that we looked for the documentary. And I was also very uh, frustrated with the way Medium was conceived in, or in digital media. So the interactive part of design is, is kind of this matrix from which we can actually slide one, uh, one block to reduce, to reduce it and do it if we increase the size of another block, which is basically uh, trying to show by practice what we were telling in the doc documentary because we, we had people from Google, a few people from Google uh, talking about um, digital services focus on your impulse and not on your intention. So we try to make an interface that is based on your intent and not in your impulse. So you will decide by yourself which medium you want to favorite, to favorite during your viewing experience. So the, the video is kind of laggy, but you will, there's no sound, there's no sound, just like to show quite close. So, so far I guess it's kind of a unique interface and a lot of UX designers didn't like it because for many reasons linked to, the, to their own belief. But it's just a way to show by practice how theory, I mean, how theory became, uh, became practice, just by giving you the choice of the medium and how you want to, to use it. So uh, my interest for ethics uh, come from a very particular moment in my life uh, when my uh, business partner and I were we are invited in San Francisco yeah, in yeah, 2014. Basically, there was like a, a worldwide challenge launched by Intel called uh, Make It Wearable, something like that. And there is one branch of this tournament that was about making a concept for social good using wearable technology made by Intel. Uh, for so at some point, we, we won it, which was fine. We got... Uh, we got we got to go to San Francisco to stay in a very nice hotel and to attend to the other part of the tournament, which was about people that will, that will show like a proof of concept, a business plan, and a working prototype in front of a, a panel of, of experts and big people from the field in San Francisco. There was a CEO of Intel, CEO of Best Buy, CEO of Louis Vuitton, North America, Serena Williams, what I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but it was a weird thing. There's yeah, so the best president of Nike, uh, Nike something like that. And so 10 teams presented the project using wearables that will make it some, to make something right out of that. And one team won. Uh, it was basically some kind of bracelet that when you, when you extend your, your arm, it starts to fly because it's a drone, and it will take a selfie of you and go back to your arm. <laughs> And they, 
they are the, they are the one who won the, main, the biggest prize, which was like something like 500,000 uh, euros or dollars to develop this, pro this product because it was a good consumer product. And other projects that, that were working for social good or, as, or at least trying to answer real needs, real needs uh, were just kind of pushed away because it was not, it will not be selling for Christmas. It will more like a niche market, stuff like that. So I was really wondering at the moment like, why this kind of project got money and why projects that are actually answering real needs or at least trying to do something a little bit better for, for all of us are not getting money. So yeah, it was a weird moment for me and I started wondering what kind of industry I'm working with and I started to do my research about ethics, but it just started as a question that was in the back of my, of my head and that at the end accumulated into this documentary. So since uh, you are course about it, just a quick thing about ethics. First, it's a Western world thing. Uh, not all philosophy formulates ethics. It's something that is really linked to the way we perceive the world as a Western society, as Western societies. There's three school of thought that I will shortly explain later in the video. But basically, the main question that we're trying to answer through ethics is how to know what is fair for me and for others. So it's not only about me, it's, on, it's also me up, up inside the community, inside the collective, uh, collective and political life. And once I've statuated on that, how do I act accordingly? So in the documentary, there is a little video trying to sum up what is ethics and what is morality and what is the difference between the two of them. So rather than me talking, I will have the video. Ethics it. and morality. We use these two words often, but do we really know what they mean? Morality focuses on absolute right and wrong. It defines what is forbidden, encouraged, or permitted. Of course, it always depends on the era and social context. For example, Christian morality was not the same in the 11th century or the 20th century, and varied between European countries. Ethics is the fundamental thought behind what it means to act well, for you and for others. This means that ethics does not say what is right or wrong, Rather, it shows you the road you should take to live better. There are three main theories to explain an ethical act. Virtue ethics says that if a man has virtuous characteristics, such as honesty, wisdom, or courage, he will have good intentions, and so will act in an ethical way. Deontology focuses on the conduct that should be followed for an action to be ethical, independent of its consequences. For example, Medical deontology obliges doctors to treat all sick patients, whoever they may be. Consequentialism determines whether an act is ethical by evaluating its consequences. It judges actions based on their observable results, rather than on the intention of the actor, which would be far more difficult to know or to prove. It is sometimes difficult to distinguish ethics from morality, as the two are intrinsically linked. We can say that ethics tends to be universal, but it is constantly reinterpreting what is the best way to live for you and others. Morality defines a group of rules and norms, which are only relevant to an individual or social group at a given moment. Okay, okay. is everybody okay so far? Good? No questions? Okay. I can, if I can check, if I question, I cannot see anyway, so. But it's important. It's important to, to talk about ethics, but it's even more important to know what ethics should lead to. And if ethics uh, means how do I formulate my personal values regarding me and other people, how do I translate that in the way I act collectively inside a space, in a city, with other people, which is the meaning of politics, according to uh, Aristoteles. Ethos means the way you act individually to embody your ethics. But ethics without politics means nothing, in my own point of view. Because any company can, can say, yeah, we have fantastic values, we have fantastic ethics. OK, but the, always the, the question you should ask is, what are you doing? How do you act to prove that? It's a question of politics and ethics. So whatever, people's, whatever, whatever people are thinking about their own ethics, ask what does it translate into politics. And this is, is when the question became harder for companies to answer to, for some of them at least. 
And today there is many ethical challenges. First, we can see there we can see here in, in Paris the question of social justice within ecological transition, the question of inequality be, between uh, different social classes, question of mental health here in any anywhere in the world, the, the issue of techno scientism, people f thinking that technology will save us, what without knowing how, the question of surveillance capitalism. How our data and our behavior on the internet has been capitalized <coughs> to make value out of that without us knowing the issue of growth when it comes linked to the question of transition. And sometimes it can be embodied with the contradiction of a world of people trying to sit to buy luxury goods while it's flooding anywhere, while, while it's, it's flooding there, sorry. And when it comes to design, there are so many challenges to address. From obsolescence, could it be planned or psychological or even technical? Overconsumption, resource use, paternalist behavioralism, okay, this is, is a big one. But the fact that people believe what is the best way for you to act is disturbing. And is it based is based on a construction on a view that people have of you? On a view that people have of you, yeah. Uh, that is actually troubling and should be contested or at least thought about. Social crushing, we can see also how the development of the so societies are isolating more and more people out of the, so so out of the so social boundaries that, that are so our societies. The, fi the confidence in data, think that data reveals everything and anything else because data is will only, only reveal what is meant to reveal. And something that, is, that does not translated to data is taken out of that. Is it, is it a really good, good way of thinking? Attention economy, the fact that you, you, may, you might spend too much time on Instagram, on Snapchat, uh, on other kind of apps like that. But Instagram is very poisonous in my, in my own view. Uh, digital labor, the fact that we're also working for free for few, co few corporations. And authoritarianism. Authorita <laughs> yeah, I, I should have not put this one too hard to say. So that's kind of the framework that we have today. So uh, we are living in a very complex world and it's getting more complex and we, tensions are being revealed every day. And each day, pa each day passing is showing more and more tension in the way we live all together because it's, a, it's on an unstable basis to start with. But this is our condition, but there's something bigger than that. There's another scale of that which is the way we live on Earth. And the question of Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene means a geological era. So before Anthropocene, there was Holocene, that was the most uh, stable climate age before that, in which human society thrived. And I found this, this is old ad, um, which basically say, each day we provide enough energy to melt seven million tons of glacier. Yes, it's an old one. It, <laughs> it will not produce any effect today. But it shows how human actually impacting the, the global ecosystem and the global systems of our Earth. That we want it or not, that's the way it is today. So Anthropocene is recognizing that the impact of modern human activities are one of the main force to transform our planet. So, and it doesn't mean climate change. Anthropocene means that we are changing one of the main force to change our Earth. As long as, as much as volcanic eruptions or movement of tectonic plates. So this is a, an example of a, of a mine. This is a, pet, a photo, photographic project I like a lot from yeah, Dylan Marsh. Basically, it's been to all mine sites, and it's been putting in 3D the amount of ore that has been extracted from the mining site. So if you can see it's a Jubilee mine in USA. So you can see the all mine so far that has been transformed to extract that amount of copper, which is 6,500 tons. And you did that with diamonds, gold, platinumites. So most of the most of the methods we use today for most of our technology. And also that's how human 
at a very little scale is also transforming in our environment. So is everybody, is everybody ent understanding Anthropocene so far? Yeah? Okay. If not, it's okay, you can tell me, and I can explain better, because I'm also talking quite fast right now. But yeah, climate change is, not, is only one thing, which is no, normally related to uh, global warming, but Anthropocene means also acidification of the oceans, means also the, the way was your body, your urbanism is taking land more and more every year. The fact that we are losing all of bio, uh, most of our biodiversity. There's many things that are inside Anthropocene that is directly related to the way we transform our environment and our planet as a whole. And more conceptually, it means something that is that is very important to understand that so far, the way our history has been taught, we've been separated of, of our Earth's history. What we always thought that human, human history, human events, events uh, emerged as it is without being in, in, fact, in any way on the way the planet was evolving. But the Anthropocene means that now we are, uh, Earth's history is not directly linked to the way we will evolve in the, near, in the near future and the way we evolve today. So that's one of the biggest concerns and the biggest conceptual, conceptual shift that is happening through the Anthropocene. We'll never look at the, pre at the past in the same way that we did today, and we'll never look at the present and the future as we did before. So this acknowledgement of the Anthropocene leads to many scenarios that are all uncertain. We don't really know how things will evolve. We have tendencies, we have forecasts, but we don't know. We cannot, we cannot have a good, we can be sure what, what, what the future holds for us, and the futures hold for us. So maybe the one thing that know is resources can can, be, can become scarce in part of on some part of Earth. We know that we're gonna lose our biodiversity, biodiversity and we need to compensate that somehow. We need that we are ex we are emitting more and more carb uh, carbon dioxide every year. We know we know all of that, but we don't know how we can let. We don't know. Uh, if we will be able to maintain supply chains, we don't know if we'll be able to have access to key resources. We don't know how we can maintain infrastructures. Something quite simple is, uh, for example, um, rail track. They start to distort after 40 when they reach 42 degrees Celsius. So, a rail track is is, is straight. 42 degrees is start to be like that. So trains cannot circulate. Can be one of the issue of global warming. If we look at human societies, there is kind of a simple thing like when we look at extreme climates, uh, extreme climatic events, drought, uh, flooding, the instability within climates means also instability in the food supply that can lead to people to leave the country. Not because they want to, but because they, they have to, because they cannot sustain their life there and they don't have access to key resources for that. So migration will be also part of this of this century more than ever, and human human life to some extent have always been moving depending on the climate. This is a picture of a very mediatic um, uh, how do you call that um, caravan that crossed Mexico and now is like kind of dying at the frontier of USA. And at the people coming from Honduras and from other countries in the area was suffering from polit political tensions, drought, loss, of, sup f uh, l uh, loss of, of food supply. So there is a multifactorial uh, situation that leads at some point to people moving. And it will be something that we'll see incre uh, increasingly. If we look at the way uh, temperature are going to evolve, I think uh, a higher global average temperature doesn't mean that it will be hot all the time, all year. It, just, it, may, it can be like colder weather also in some part of Earth. It can, be, it can lead to warmer weather. So I think you are kind of, you all uh, saw at, at some point uh, the name of IPCC, which is uh, 
a group of experts on the climate that is working together to condense all the scientific publication in one in one publication and to make advice for politicians to act. So there is two scenarios right now. There is a more optimistic one, there is a pessimistic one. And there is other scenarios in between. The LCP 2.6 uh, that you see on the top just mean like a concentration of carbon in the in the atmosphere that is equal to 2.6 and and the more pessimistic scenario is 8.5 we're kind of reaching here to be fair but uh, this is kind of how the average temperature on earth will evolve uh, you have you have to understand that a global average temperature has no meaning for us because as the average temperature is a more of a scientific global mathematic value, mathematical value, it will never be perceived. It's just a scientific value, and you will not feel like in 30 years, I think it's averagely one, <laughs> one degree more. It will, not it will not happen like that. It's just for scientists to show uh, the urgency for politicians to act. We are good? Yeah? Good. If you have any question, if you have something you don't understand, if my accent is too strong, <laughs> tell me. So over time, it means that depending on the scenario, we can, we can reach almost four degrees more on a global average temperature. Uh, to give you like a perspective on that, when, humanity, when Earth was going through ice age, it was minus four degrees so it was actually, if we go to zero, okay, here's the ice age, which is basically the opposite of that. So uh, four, uh, less four degrees on the global temperature is an ice age. But we don't know what will translate when it's plus four degrees in a, in a, by the end of the century. So the issue with that is that directly linked to carbon, mostly to carbon. And I don't know, but maybe you've seen a lot of thing, a, lo a lot of focus giving, being given on carbon dioxide, and I don't know if you always you even want, uh, ever wonder why are we, are we focusing on carbon? Why is it carbon? Why are we always talking about carbon? No, you know that what carbon policy is right, but you don't know why. Okay, so any any clues? when you yeah, but why why should we re reduce carbon? Because it's a greenhouse gas. But it's it's only one gas between many others. It's the most common one. <laughs> but that's a good question to ask. Why do we, why are we focusing on carbon when we have much more gas, green greenhouse gases existing? And for example, one of the most uh, one of the gas. Uh, that has the most heating effect is uh, water, water vapor. But it's only lasting five, five years in the atmosphere, not like carbon. So the first thing to understand is whatever we are doing as humans, us as a carbon budget. Every year there is millions of tons being exchanged between ecosystems, forests, oceans, and, and carbon be being given back on Earth. So it, there is always a budget happening every year whatever we are doing, that, and if human were not there, it would be the same. But the issue is we are adding our own carbon dioxide due, due to our activities. That's why we call anthropogenic uh, CO2 uh, carbon dioxide emissions. It's just the little carbon that we are adding into the atmosphere is actually the one creating the imbalance and creating the warming effect that we are, that we're going to suffer in, in the few years to come. So, the issue of carbon dioxide that might be very terrifying for you. There is two tempor temporal dimensions to carbon. First, the time between emission, getting out of a, of a car, and the time it would, it would like to reach atmosphere. On average, depending on, depending on the publication, it can, be, it, can, it, can take uh, it can take 10 years for a particle here to reach atmosphere. So right now we are living in a world that has been designed but by emission that has been emitted 10 years ago. And sometimes we think it can be like uh, uh, almost 30 years ago. 
And the fact is that carbon stays in the atmosphere. You, you, you cannot entirely suck it up. Whatever you are doing, it will be there. It will, it will accumulate, and you cannot subtract, subtract it. That's why we are focusing on carbon. Because whatever we are doing, it will stay for at least 1,000 years. So we are actually designing Earth's climate for the next 1,000 years to come. And all greenhouse gases don't have that much residence time in the, in the, in the atmosphere. That's why we are focusing on carbon. Because on the long term, it's the, most, it's the biggest warming, uh, warming effect of all gases. We good? Okay, you don't want to cry? At some point, I promise, we'll talk about design. <laughs> so, and the other issue of uh, warming that has been caused by carbon dioxide is that we are fearing that there is tipping points in our Earth that can be activated if the warming effect is, is keep, uh, keep increasing at the same rate. And the issue of the tipping points is if we reach them, they're going to lock us in a warming effect, whatever we're doing. So, for example, in the north of Russia, in Sabaya, there is what's called uh, permafrost, which is actually uh, uh, stalking the gigantic quantities of carbon dioxide. And if this permafrost sheet uh, is going to melt, it's going to release carbon dioxide for the 100 years to come. So that's why we don't want to reach that tipping point. But because if we reach it, we're going to be locked in a, in a, warming, in a long warming effect. That's why, carbon is a f that's why we focus on carbon, to avoid long-term wa warming. But the issue is carbon energy, carbonated energy, oil, gas, coal, <coughs> is, whatever, is what makes our economy. So basically, when we say biofood, Biofuels, we, we mean uh, uh, wood. And since we started the Industrial Revolution, most in UK and through the years, you can see that we rely even more than ever on carbonated energies, coal, oil, gas, and all growth is directly linked. I've been directly linked to uh, to carbon to carbon energy. So how do we get of that? That's the issue that, that nobody has an answer for so far. So this is kind of a very important of all numbers. But. So in the G20, this is our average economic growth. But more economic growth requires more energy. So we have also a rising demand for energy. And more energy produced means more carbon. So more economic growth will, need, will, means, will mean more carbon. Be and we are trying to think that we can produce economic growth without uh, cheap carbon energy, but so far nobody, <laughs> nobody thinks we can do it. I mean, few people, few people think that we can do it, but looking at, looking at what's going on right now, we cannot, we cannot go through economic growth without uh, cheap carbon energy. Okay, so it was kind of the context and now we can think of design within that. I'm going to drink a little bit. So, uh. Still good? OK. So theory of design. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to, to go very quickly on that, because I think some of, uh, most of you will know it. But in design, we give mostly like three different kind of birth histories. First, we have the Quattrocento uh, in, in Italy, like the Enlightenment, kind of the, no, not the Enlightenment, but Renaissance. 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 <laughs> uh, well, we think uh, it was a period of, of history where architecture, that was more of a craftsmanship, started to be separated from the practice to become more of a project. So you think of the building before making it. That was kind of, kind, of, kind of a big shift. Because, for example, when you look at the cathedrals um, all over Europe, nobody, we don't have any plan for that because it was, it was built without plans. Because at the time, architecture was not think separately from the, the thing from making. Then we can give another 
and also birth date to the design, which is more Crystal Palace during the Industrial Revolution. The Crystal Palace is a, um, have been the first um, building that have been um, made for the Universal Expo exhibition, exhibition. And it was the first time we standardized a whole process to make all the windows for this building that was been assembled very quickly for the time. So it's more designed as an intro practice. When we are standardizing, we are doing mass production. So it's the end of manual labor and craftsmanship to some extent. Then we have another one, which is a the resistance to that, which are the arts and, arts and crafts led by uh, many people, uh, including William Morris. So it's more designed as a resistance to mass production and to standardiza standardization and, and at the end against mass consumption. So in these three stories, there are also like two missions of design that have been intertwined. So first, and mainly, design is about maintaining and increasing consumption cycles. We are an e design is mainly an economical lubricant. We are here to maintain product production cycles. And it's kind of the, sadly, it's, it's kind of what main, main design is so far. But we have another one. Uh, which has been proposed by Alain Fidelli, Fidelli, is designed as maintaining or increasing the world's inability for the user and for, for the usage in French. So it's how do we think of a world psychologically, culturally, socially, economically, uh, with your basic needs of having a, sh having a shelter, having a house, uh, having a warm place to stay, having good health, how do you maintain and increase that over time as a design practice? And design is, is full of this contradiction intertwining like from some kind of sci-fi, weird future of interior design thing from the 80s to thinking of how a kitchen will help uh, the housewife to emancipate herself but actually taking her back in, into the kitchen like the work of Charles Perriand. Also, also this kind of contradiction of to advertise uh, products without knowing the consequences of that, of cultivating a certain image of bodies, of gender, of women, of consumer goods, of entertainment, of working with large corporations, maintaining consumption cycles for large, large, uh, large corporations without any regards for the externalities of these activities, not taking, not taking care, not taking into account how do, how do we dispose of the products we are making, of working from mass advertisements and at the same time fostering mass production for a fake craftsmanship or to, or to real craftsmanship that have been industrialized through, uh, through, uh, through industrial processes thinking of a certain idea of technology, of future, of progress. So design, through its practice, its practice, have been uh, fostering a certain idea of the world, which is mainly an idea of the Western world, through Western uh, conception, Western logics, Western kind of doing science, Western, Western thinking of the other, Western thinking uh, of the genders, of thinking that we have universal value that we can apply to any context, to any cultures. Design, as a Western practice, is m a lot about that. And most designers don't realize that through that practice, they are actually uh, playing agendas and maintaining certain politics in societies. And even uh, very famous schools such as Bauhaus through that practice, have been putting into the world a certain idea of how the world should be from a very Western perspective. But the demonstration through the Western tendency of design is just to show you how design is building worlds around us without us as user knowing it or without us as designers knowing it. And I, I would like to go a little deeper uh, on on the question of where design gets its idea of the world, which is for me part of my research and part of something I've been very interested in. 
And for that, we need to look at economics, which is my favorite part. Maybe not, it might not be yours, though. The hypothesis I've been formulating is that design practice, design theory, have been mainly informed on the way it perceives the world by uh, main economics at a given time. There, there is few economic, macroeconomic theory that have been trendy over time, over the, the past two centuries. And I think there is direct link on how economics sees the world and how design sees the world. <coughs> okay, so we have our events. Industrial revolution is happening, Russian revolution, Black Tuesday, post-war growth, digitization. So we have kind of a timeline going on. <coughs> and how you can see economic theories uh, kind of advancing through that, through time, uh, accordingly to what happened in the world. So it's not, in, it's not interesting for you to know the other theories. <coughs> and I think my position through the timeline is not really good at that. But just to know, there is economic theories. So theories of how we see the world as an economic activity that have been that have, that have been living and have been overlaying and working together to to create a certain view on how the world should should be. And the fact is design has been kind of following that anyway, because design, if anything else, is a is a meeting of industry, economy, urban life. So when you meet this character as design is also Evolving through history, through the beginning of industrial design, with at some point Crystal Palace, we are always resisting, resisting against that through arts and, arts and crafts. The so Bauhaus uh, arriving after or during the, the First World War, and modern design, which I encompass a lot of things, but made main, mainly linked to how do we create consumption to launch economy after the Second World War. And now we are kind of living in this kind of uh, human centeredness of UX, UI, human centered design, thinking that we need to put the human in the center. And it has been evolving. But if you look at the way <coughs> an economic theory is informing design, there is always a balance. There is always something that, something that goes from economy to design. First, we think that classical theory start with exploitation of the land is what, uh, from what the West comes from. We, and it comes also a bit before because from the physiocrats. But by exploiting land, you've got, you can get to wealth. So at the beginning of the capital th capitalist thinking. Then we start to think with Smith that everything is economic. And we think of the value of labor, the value of specialization on assembly lines to, to maintain, uh, to maintain high production levels, and to start to think that markets self-regulate. Then we start to have rational agents, the homo economicus, thinking that humans, as we are, as rational agents that are just doing trade or making choices just to increase our happiness, and that's our, our only goal as humans. Then we also, we also start to think that markets reach an equilibrium, so it's basically the th theory of supply and demand. So we, I think you always have, you already heard of that, but we think that markets reach an optimum when offer and demand meet, and the de the price of this meet, that the price that, that is led to this meeting is the optimum price. The perfect the perfect offer to the perfect demand led to an optimum price. That's what we call an equilibrium. And we think there is no externalities that I will explain later. Then, after the Second World War, we start to think that because we need to launch back the economy, that state should intervene and maintain growth through the years with through major investments. And so it's kind of the start of management. We need to manage our economy. We need to manage the state to, ma to maintain growth. So that will be that a bit later through man management theory and also design management theory, by the way. And now we're kind of on, a, on the last thing of behavioral economics that has been like a very trendy topic since the uh, 90s, thinking that market has not, are not perfect, but it's because we are, we are irrational beings, but because we are biased. So we are going to make a list of biases 
to adjust our behavior so it will fit with the market. That leads today to something that we all know in design, which is thinking that doing human-centered design and to correct the biases of human through interfaces, through experience, we're going to correct that behavior to reach the, uh, the behavior that we want for our experience, for our website, for our app, which led to the Persuasive Design Lab in Stanford, which led to Hooked, also this kind of uh, theory book about how to get people hooked on applications and digital services. And it's, it's a concrete uh, practice of eco eco uh, economical theory. There is three myths that design actually uh, get out of that, that I want to talk about today. So we think that design works for humans and the needs. Actually, if you look, if you look, uh, if you look a bit longer at what we consider as human in design, you will understand that there have never been any human, most of the time, it's just an economic persona. We are designing for a human that we got from economics, which means a rational being that wants to maximize his happiness. So we are always trying to design for this kind of robot that only wants one thing is to reach happiness. There is no irrational, irrationality in that, inside that. And we still think that while we are doing human-centered design, well, or human that we use in economy is just a persona, is a fiction of what we think is a human. But it comes from economics. Then we think that resources, including energy, are limitless because our economy, economics, uh, econ economical models are based on an infinite growth and not, on a, and not, not really regarding how resources and energy will last. And they are based on the very uh, conceptual truth that in a, any economic theory, uh, resources or matter has no value, so no cost. So you can take everything out from us, it's for free, because it was given to us. Which means, for example, uh, I've led a, a workshop recently asking designers, uh, web designers, uh, to consider website, not with a uh, monetary budget, not with euros or pounds, but I, I gave them a uh, kilowatt hour to consider a website. They could not reach that because they don't know what are the cost, the real cost energy and resource-wise to make, to make something happen through design, which is, a very, which is a very alarming thing, actually. As designers, we don't understand the real cost of what we're doing because we don't, we don't understand that we are based on limited resources and energy. If you're designing uh, a tea kettle, when you plug, when you plug it, you never think that the source of energy will, will fail. You're always based on the thinking that I will plug it and it will work because there is a magic plug, magic socket that will provide infinite energy. And we never, we never thought of designing objects thinking. I mean, we thought of it, but not not anymore. We never thought of. Of, the, of making objects that will work or last even without, even without, the, without power or uh, for long sustained power cuts. So the third myth, I need a bit of context with that, there is no externalities. In economics, an externality is the fact that something has, has cost too much, so you miscalculated, you misunderstood, mis, no. Uh, underestimated the cost, and so you overestimated your benefits. So, for example, as an industry, I will I will make my industry next to a river. I will my waste will go through the river. It's fine because I didn't include the cost of depolluting in my cost. So, but if I had to, if I had to uh, to add the cost of depolluting into my business plan then it, the price on how we say my products will not be the same. So which means, because I didn't count pollu pollution as a cost, my costs are underestimated, and the benefit I'm getting out of that is overestimated. Good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, okay. So if we go the other way, if we go for positive externalities, which means I've underestimated, uh, no, overestimated my cost, and I've underestimated my benefits. For example, for bees, the, the bees that are, will go from flowers to flowers to pollinate. 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 
uh, I've actually, it's through this action, they are actually, um, how do you say that? I'm losing my, my English French. Uh, yeah, the action. Yeah, I, I can mime it. <laughs> it will not be good. But the fact that they are actually full pollination, they are uh, spreading species and also making flowers come back next year, is not a benefit that is accounted in what bees uh, uh, bees do for us. So if I was a bee maker, I could actually ask money for to the nearby farmers. Because, because of my bees, the fields are getting pollinated. But then we don't account for that. So these are externalities, which means back to uh, back to our topic, that in design, we don't value pollution into the cost of our design. Because in economics, we don't have externalities for a very simple reason: if a market is a meeting of an offer and a demand to give an optimum price. If I have externalities, it means my cost is not optimum. So I will never reach an optimum price. So it means that economic theory doesn't work if there is externalities. This, this point is hard. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So basically, if we can pollution into business models, we need to rethink the way we want to think of markets. And in design, we never, we rarely, in mainstream design, we rarely count for that. An example of that, very easy, digital industry. We think of this, this dream of dematerialization. We think that we can reach everything for digital industry. Well, actually, this is kind of the hyper-materialized uh, moment in our life. It's a hyper-materialized trend inside industry and inside our lives. More than ever, we've been relying on materiality. We're just getting bet better at hiding it. And design is very good at hiding materiality. So, it's a bit in French and English, but it's fine. Uh, basically, the only thing you need to get out of this, of this graph is from 2013 to, 20, to 2020, we're gonna, we're gonna double our energy consumption for the digital industry, which means we need, we need to build more power plants, we need to extract more coal or gas or oil or other energies to maintain the growth of the digital industry, which is very problematic. And one thing before going to the other. So here we are talking about energy. So we are producing energy, and then we can transform energy to make electricity. Electricity is not energy. Electricity is a vector of energy. So here we are talking about energy, but it doesn't mean electricity, because it's really important for the next graph, which is basically comparing energy consumption to electricity consumption. So let's, uh, let's say that we use 50% of our energy production every year, to make electricity, it means that by 2030, from the 50% of electricity we are producing, half of it will be used to power digital industry. And hence, it means a lot of energy, a lot of power plants to maintain this growth, which is also a very problematic thing, because we, ca we cannot reduce carbon emissions while maintaining this, this growth rate in digital industry. And the fact is, it's linked to many things. It can be linked to, uh, to the way we conceive things in the digital industry. And then we'll talk about that later. But basically, we see that uh, by 2020, uh, digital industry will, will add 1% more of carbon emission in, into, uh, into our world to reach 3%, which will be equal to um, plane traffic, annual plane traffic emissions. So more than ever, digital industry is contributing to global warming to some extent, and also to, to the materiality of our world. And if you look at where does where, where, where does the energy come from, and why do we uh, how do we use it? So if this is um, like the old digital industry 
yeah, an energy consumption. That part is just the energy we need to produce goods, to produce objects, uh, terminals, data centers. It's just building stuff for the digital industry. And this is just the energy that, is, that we use to maintain it, to make it run. So production, use. And within that, you have a little bit of data centers, networks, and just terminals or computers, um, phones, and etc. TVs, etc. So that's why it's so, uh, when you are changing your phone, you're actually losing all the energy that, that have been used to produce it. And if you look at the numbers, your laptop, to make it, we're going to consume 3,400 uh, water, water liters. We're going to use the energy that, the, the energy that we're going to use to make your laptop will be maybe 90% of all the energy you will use uh, with your laptop from production to the time you are discarding it. And it's, for your point, it's the same thing. The amount of energy you use just by using it for three years will be maybe like 5% of the energy that has been used to make it. So when you are throw, throwing away your phone, you are throwing away all of that too. And obviously, all the metals that have been used to, uh, to create the components inside these objects, so laptops, smartphones, TV, a smartphone is 500 liters of water. So if we gave an example of one of the big myths that we have today, which is uh, autonomous vehicles. So we are saying it's fantastic. We're going to have people not driving cars. People, cars driving by themselves can make a economic and business models out of that. The fact is that, according to Intel, uh, per day, an autonomous, uh, autonomous car is producing 4,000 gigabytes of data that you might need to, st to, uh, to store somewhere for insurance, insurance reasons or for self-improvements, machine learning reasons. And just to store uh, the data that will be produced by 1 million cars like that, we're gonna, we, we're, gonna need, we're gonna need to double all the data centers in the world. So the, again, energy impacts, so carbon emission impact. So this kind of dream that we have about technology and the way uh, technology will save us or can provide us a better future, actually quite, quite false. Because it's just that even if we're hiding the materiality of that, it will affect, it will affect all of us because you know, we are in the Anthropocene, and whatever we do to, to produce that, it will affect all of us in the long term. And to be fair, even if there is nobody driving this car, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna have to have so much people mining in Africa, in South America, to produce all these cars. So even if we, even if there's been sell autonomous car, it needs more people than ever to actually make it, and to make it run, and to maintain it. Good? No, clear. Okay, clear. yes, <laughs> okay, tell me everything. Oh no, this is just very depressing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the next slide is the most depressing one actually. Oh. We're gonna have so much fun. <laughs> no, it's gonna be my provocation slide for you all. Okay. So, yeah. so it was the topic of today, the politics of design on the damage on the damage of and the politics are no polarizing in a very simple way, in my opinion, because there is no neutral neutral stance now. If you keep business as usual, you are maintaining destructive activities that you know you all know. Which means there is doing design as usual or business as usual means that you are maintaining if you are maintaining mainstream design practice, you are maintaining way of destructing the planet. It's, it's a bit too much, but it's just for provocation. But you, are, you, are, you will be part on a very small scale of the destructive processes of ecosystems and territories. So now, the all, all the thing, because if design as usual is not neutral and it means that, now we need to look at other ways and there is not one way, there's many ways of, to think of it. But if you look at transition activities, it's kind of the shift I've made during my practice. It's how do we think of design differently? Because design have been 
have, has emerged in a context, in a extra historical uh, economical uh, context that have been completely changing today. So design practice and design as a theory, or as a kind of a discipline, is not suited for these new challenges. So we are entering in a phase of, I think, I think we're entering a phase in design, or we need to redesign the practice to make it fit with the new condition of existence of Earth, on Earth. So it means many things, and I will give you my two cents on how I shifted my practice. But just to advise it even more, so <laughs> you can choose between maintaining destruction practice, practices of environments, which I call agualism, but to, to be fair, I account it for main, mainstream practice of design, which is mainly ad agency, consumer goods, but there is many ways to do design that are not maintaining this kind of activities, but most of it are. So how do we think of design in a new framework? So how do we design within the Anthropocene? So it's not a dramatic scenario. There is actually, it's opening so many ways of thinking of design that no, you are not fixed just one way to do it and to think, how can I make a cool thing between the small practice of design? So it's how do I design again entirely and how do I explore a new world of design through the new world that is the Anthropocene? So it, it's time to be playful again. It's not about coolness or anything like that. No, it's about getting the, your hands dirty and to think of all the preconception, all the concepts that have been embedded in the practice and that you be never challenging or maybe not enough. Or maybe you have, d you have done it already. I don't know you. First thing, to frame it back, design is, has only one temporal dimension. Very simple. Design is the everyday life. Design is about, uh, I thought I read it today, is the everydayness. So, uh, so we are working only the everyday life of people. Can it be present or future? It's just one, it's one present day or one future day in the life of someone. But at the end, the design, at least for me, and you can change it as much as you want, is about the everyday life. That's why we are not art practice to some extent, because we are here to spend one day with someone and to intervene, this is one day of someone that might repeat or not. So it's, it's not like doing tourism just to watch a big monuments. It's like being in a, in a new city to look at how the transport are functioning, how people are interacting to each other, what is the food. It's looking at how people interact in the daily life and how do I intervene as a designer. It's my only time frame, which is not a new, and which is kind of a universal thing, but it's many, depending on the culture, there's many, many different ways to open it. Then space, I don't have any other words to say than milieu, because it, for me French is quite good, but I don't know in English how to say it. But the, one of the main issues for me for design is hiding where object comes from. And this is very boring, because as much as our digital goods are taking more and more out of Earth, and also emitting, and taking more energy and emitting more, more carbon, we don't know the impact of what we do for a consumption choice. And I took a little bit of example um, from a fair phone. So a fair phone is a phone you can, it is made to be repairable and uh, ethical. And when you open it, you can see, uh, it's a map of Congo in Africa, and you can see where the mine is, uh, the, way, the mine that's producing the talent and tin. You can see the supply road that, that the truck is taking and why is shipping it later. We need to find ways for designers to connect, and for design products, to connect back to, connect back to where things come from. Because it's very nice to have a, um, I have a MacBook Pro, so, but, uh, to, to have things that have nice, uh, nice looking, very, very, um, uh, how do you say, um, interactive and uh, smooth and blah, blah, blah. But I want to know what it means wh wh when I'm uh, buying it, and I want to know what it means when I will waste, when I will discard it, and I want to know how I can repair it because I want to know the toll I'm taking by buying that and by discarding that. And we need to know where things come from. It's just it goes from clothes, 
from, computer, from consumer goods, digital products, the, think clearly of how do I make the link between the, the mind from which the ore is extracted to make a consumer good. And then, I cannot emphasize more on that, I think. But be very careful as design, as a way to see the world, as a Western person. Uh, there is many other ways to see the world from a Chinese perspective, from an Indian perspective, from a, from a society in South America, from, from a village in Indonesia. Uh, the way we see the world is not a, something that we share, it's something that we negotiate with other people. And we should be very careful not to impose our own views of how the world should be to other people without negotiate, negotiating it or without making it visible to people that we are actually enforcing our views on them. And the way we are doing right now, because we need to negotiate the way we live on us with many people from different cultures, we cannot squeeze a cultural way, squeeze the, the way they see the world and squeeze the way they live away because we think we have a better solution. Because obviously, the way Western societies have been evolving so far have not produced the best thing for more people, in my opinion. So we need to open up to other ways to organize. And more, more importantly, if design, so it's about something else in the everyday life, it's about negotiating the everyday life. And we need to open this process of negotiation. I'm gonna drink, I've been speaking a lot. Are you still okay? Alive? Oh. I have not really a question, but more like a comment or interest yeah. maybe like an open discussion thing. Because you talk about uh, the need to tell people where the products come from or where the price come from. Yeah. But I think there's an entire space missing between those two steps because I don't think a lot of people know what is actually within products or what mm. the products actually made out of. Yeah. So I think that entire stage maybe like in the essential would be to first educate people on what is actually within, what, what are the products that are being used, and then where, where they come from. Mm. So how do you see that happen like, within the next? Mm. Yeah. Um, if you see that with the case of fair fun, the object can be a way to educate. Education and object, should, it, should, should they be separated? They can achieve the same purpose at once. And the way to do that, I, would, I, I have an example of that, but it's very subtle things. Uh, I will answer for another slide, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I've been writing a book recently, and this is definitely not something you, uh, you should take as granted, or take it like that, because it's still a work in progress. But that's my own principles while designing, because I've been shifting my practice through the past years to have like kind of checkpoint of what I think design is. So first thing, I, need, I acknowledge that human activities are the main driver of the way we transform Earth. Then we need to transition out of the way we are living as societies based on carbonated energy and massive use of resource. And the way that we actually, as designers, in, instead of uh, maintaining consumption cycles, we should think of how do we reduce consumption? Because that's kind of a tricky question economically and on an ecological level. Uh, because I think there is many subtle ways to, to, to contest systems of production, system of, system of consumption with a, with a minimum amount of resources. And most importantly, there is something that in, quite, in, that in, uh, in what design is really good without knowing it, is what we call the rebound effect. The fact that through the, through the uh, past few years we've been getting very good at making uh, faster chipset, faster product, better products, but we, we bought even more of them. So even if the piece is more efficient as a whole, we're consuming even more of them because to some point of design. So for example, we've seen that people that are buying um, hybrid cars or electric cars tend to drive more because they are less concerned about the about the carbon emission and the pollution they will do. So basically, by driving more through the really nice electric car, they're actually emitting uh, the same amount or even more amounts of carbon, C or carbon emission than people that would have a normal car. 
because it because they are less incentive to drive less. And a little important that uh, electric cars run with coal, gas, and uh, and oil. Don't forget that because it's electricity that you give it to. So since electricity is made out of coal, gas, and uh, and oil, it's still a oil powered car, except in few places where we have nuclear power. Like in France, obviously most of the electricity comes from nuclear power, so uh, an electric car is emitting less uh, carbon dioxide than, than a normal car. So that's the rebound effect. So we, we've made better cars, but since people are consuming more of them, then the effects, the gain that we made of making better products are completely counteracted by the fact we're consuming more. And Dillard is very good at that. Um, also, to go back to the territories, because we think of design as an urban practice, we, uh, we think of style, we think of different inspirations that we have, but at the end, and we think also we have like a universal values that we can carry through design, that a share will be the same and will be used in the same way in every part of the world, because my vision of a share will be universal. It's not like that. Territories are linked to ecosystems, to so different ways of organizing societies, culture, uh, other climates, other food production, other habits. So design should be contextualized in a territory. And I cannot emphasize more because design has been very out of that as a mainstream practice. Because like, if you do your UX research, you will, go, you will go in a place, you will ask people questions about your new app, they will go away. It's like you are not, you are not, you're really getting into the life of people. You are just like sucking them in your little uh, UX research and taking, and taking taking them out. If you want to do an ex if you want to do research, you need to get into the life of people, in what it means to live where they live. And also because we need to we need to know, we need we need not to acknowledge more than humans. We also need to acknowledge non-human communities. The fact that we interact with non-human actors. Ecosystems, uh, species, other species, uh, flora, fauna. We need to take that into account in the way we are designing. And this is kind of my, kind of my catch time, but putting design into politics as an act of negotiating collective ability of the world, and ability of the world. Uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to reach through my practice, because I think we need to, lo to look back at the daily life and how we negotiate that. And at the end, also, designing as an economical act, because design is an economical act of anticipating externalities of what it puts into the world. You cannot design a thing while not thinking how it will be discarded and how it will be, how the components will, will, uh, will create a, a new extraction demand in which country, for which supply chain. It's become much more complex, but much more interesting and also much more better for everybody. So to sum it up, yeah, uh, I still have, okay. <laughs> Are you still alive? Yeah? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, need to, we need to start wrapping up with this. Yeah, everybody is okay, like you, uh, no, no, nobody crying, that's good. Uh, so, there is, that, there is vectors that we need, we need to look at, where we, where we put the new negotiation of design. First, we need to think at what we need to take care of, that we want it or not, that there will, there will be things that we need to take, to take care of. Uh, there is a very uh, clear example, nuclear centrals. You might be against nuclear power or not, you will have to take, uh, take care of it, because they are there and they need maintenance, and you need people to take, to take care of that. Even if you call them or not, you need time to call them. So we need, to, we need to look at what we need to take care of. And then you can ask yourself what I want to care about. What do I want? For me to uh, to uh, to to, uh, to, ex to to invite in my life, what is important for me, and what I want to hold on to, what is in my life that I can, can sp I don't need, and I want to keep because it has something more important than any any uh, other things, and also what is holding me, why I cannot achieve certain things through design because of specific economic models, for example, or political organizations, and at the end. It comes into the everyday life. Could it be present, future, imagine, experience? That's where design is playing. That's kind of the scale of intervention of design. So, if we look at what's happening right now 
in design to foster this new politics of design. So from one side, on the theory side, um, transition design that has been uh, sustained by uh, Terry Irwin. Yeah, Terry Irwin came on top of wise. And I've been trying to frame a new way to practice design to transition to a better world. Or to a sustainable world, sorry, not better. Those other way of seeing the world, other way of developing fictions, of telling stories of how you can how we can evolve as societies, as species. So this is part of the roadmap that I've been doing here at the famous architecture studio uh, OMA or MA. So they've been doing like they did ask for the European Commission to think of a new European grid for energy. And through all the, through all the words they produced, they did one map that is quite interesting, is to rethink of nation, of Europe, based on the energy source. So here you have enhanced geothermalia, here you have central hydropia, here you have biomass board, you have geothermalia, eyes of wind, tidal states, where you can have like tidal power stations. So the way we see the world is changing and we need to acknowledge that and to build new stories, new fiction about it to make people think of the way they can, they can uh, intervene into the world. Communities, transition town movements, uh, rural mayors, or even Detroit that have been through a state of social, industrial, economic, or political crush, and are now rebuilding in new models of collective organization, of political life. Look, looking also at systems. Okay, so that's my answer for what you asked me before. It's kind of my, uh, one of my research projects. I tried to link uh, the way a digital object is existing and performing as an object to the ecosystem from which uh, materials are extracted to make this very object. And to do that, I, 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 I thought of objects, uh, digital objects giving performances. Your phone has a maximum brightness, maximum vol uh, speaker volume, maximum computational power. And, it, and I've been twisting it, adjusting the system in a very other, di in a, another direction. And I made a bill that I, to present Our to the project parliament. project is about indexing one technological performance to the resources reserved that enables it. It means that a technological performance, like the phone's screen brightness, will depend on the known reserve of indium, a key metal in the manufacturing yeah. of touchscreens. Indium is a metal, just remember that. So if the known reserves of indium are decreasing, your screen's brightness will decrease too. This principle might apply to many performances of technological objects surrounding us, from maximum speed of cars to computational power of electronic devices. This video will be about why and how we can do that. First, why? We consume too many technological products compared to what our planet can sustain. This consumption is linked to an extraction industry that consumes huge amounts of carbonated energy and admits an astonishing amount of pollution in fragile ecosystems and weakens territories and the communities that live within them. The extracted ore will be shipped and transformed using, again, a huge amount of energy to supply electronics manufacturing industries that will again consume a lot of energy and resources to produce electronics components. These components will end up in a device that might be discarded after one year of use due to the release of a new model that is supposedly better. Most of the device's components will not be recycled and will extract new ore to face the growing demand. We all know that to a certain extent, but we tend to overlook it as it does not affect the way we use our devices that only exist because of extraction and production industries. The objects we're consuming are always disconnected from where they come from. Our consumption of technological devices, mostly in Western countries, is highly problematic, and yet we need to make our devices more durable, easily repairable, and less resources intensive, as the impacts of this consumption can't be absorbed anymore by our planet. Indexing a performance to a resource means that every technological product, whether it is new or used, will be indexed in the same way. So if I discard my old phone with a brightness of, let's say, 80%, my new phone will start at 80% too, as the reserves of a given resource would not have changed. The novelty of a product will not renew its performances. We aim to achieve three things through this initiative. Number one, 
reducing the overall consumption of technological devices and the resources allocated to them. Number two, creating a direct link between technological objects and where they come from, and by doing so, also creating systemic behavioural change. Number three, preparing people to consciously accept a loss of general comfort for the sake of our existence on Earth. How can we do that? Do you think it's possible to easily reduce performances of millions of devices from one day to another? Yes, it is possible. It happened last year, and we're also doing it almost every day. Last year, Apple purposely reduced the performances of their older models because the new OS update was too demanding for batteries. Few lines of code were secretly added to reduce this effect, and eventually it was discovered by users and complaints followed. Nevertheless, it proved that it's actually easy to artificially reduce performances on a large scale on multiple devices. Without noticing it, Apple made our proof of concept. Moreover, we consciously decide to reduce performances on our mobile devices every day by turning on the low power mode. So the behavior already exists, even if it happens for a different purpose. In essence, implementing a limit to a technological performance consists of adding few lines of code into an operating system that will request a value from the database. Your phone OS will ask, let's say on a monthly basis, what's the maximum brightness it can reach according to how much Indian reserves are left. Now you should wonder, how do we know about and calculate reserves? And how do we decide about the performance slash resource pairing? That's what we'll see in the next video. Okay, that was one example of how these principles can be applied in a kind of a simple way. Uh, there is also one, one of my specialty is also like looking at digital industry and how do we think of digital industry when we know the amount of energy and resources that we need to sustain that. And how can we put other uh, scenarios or other imagination of technology out of mass consumption of resources and energy? Uh, there's something that's called low tech design, which is quite interesting. Uh, one thing very simple the most low tech website in the world is also the, one of the most used is Wikipedia. Very, very little uh, website compared to what it does. Wikipedia in English is 9 gigabytes for the all kind of all knowledge of humanity. That's how you make a good website, consuming very few, uh, lo uh, not a lot of energy, because they wanted to reduce their economical costs. UK government making templates, codifying everything to fit the most accessible platform for every citizen, whatever their connection, whatever their devices, whatever their needs, and to make it very, very uh, small regarding uh, the energy demand. And kind of my favorite example is Lotech magazine. So they build, they rebuild their own website using Lotech principles and showing uh, something very important: the energy used by the website. So they made their own their own server, which is based in Barcelona. It is powered by a solar panel in Barcelona. And basically, you can access the website when there is sun, because there is a solar, solar panel. When there is no sun, no website. So the overlaying yellow block here is the reserve level of the battery. So it's 48% right now. And when you are browsing uh, all of the day, sometimes it's going down, and sometimes it goes offline. And the website is always showing the weather forecast to tell you like, when it will be accessible or not. This other ways to think of technology, other ways to, feel, to, uh, to think of digital industry. I'm almost done. Two more slides. <laughs> so when you think of making, people now are thinking of objects that will last as much as possible using spare parts that are, will not be critical. So I don't know why, but people are very focusing on washing machines. Uh, and so there is a group of designers that are trying to make uh, the centenary washing ma washing machine. One washing machine that can last 100 years, whatever happened, and easy to repair for 100 years, basically. So in conclusion, I will do it shortly, but designing, the politics of designing in this new context that we are entering, means to learn how to take care of design, to learn how to envision new imaginaries to to open new imaginaries of, we think of what we think of the world and of technology, and also how to negotiate with that. How to negotiate with people that are not sharing the same thing, that are being pushed away from society, that have been 
or people that have too much power in society. So we need to think of that and to think of designing very uh, as a as an act to collectively, so politics, to collectively imagine, which is very important. You don't negotiate if you don't know what you can negotiate. You need to open up imaginaries. And if our tech imagination is only linked to autonomous cars, drones, and stuff like that, there is nothing to negotiate or there is nothing to debate. There's, we can only, we can only, uh, how do you say, submit? No. Yeah, we can, you can only accept it. And to, to uh, this new everyday life that is opening to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're a little past eight o'clock. If there are burning questions, so can, you, can you stay for another? Oh yeah, sure. If you are not dead, yeah. What was the device again that had the map of the Congo? Uh, I can show it here. It's my phone. Fair phone. That, that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, I thought it was not. Uh, but if you want, I can. I will take it, turn it off, and if I can open it. Basically, just a phone that you can repair. So every spare part can be ordered individually. It's it's meant to last a lot of years. What's the name again? Fairphone. Fairphone. Yeah. Oh, wait. So that so that phone it shows you where the components came Just one. Oh. But then how would you know, like say for example, if the work is involved, like this is a fair wage or working conditions, how, how does that get measured? Because it's it's, it's uh, said on the website. Mm. Whoa. Mm. But yes, they have the whole social program that ensuring that the mines are not part of a war economy. Mm. They are open a, a pension system for the manufacturer for the uh, worker in China that is making the funds. It's kind of a uh, systemic uh, thinking that they're opening with that. But they said like anyway, the CEO of the brand said, that's not a fair fund, that's a fairer fund compared to what exists because it's impossible to make a fair fund. Right. Because the, the oil you will use, the material you will extract, cannot make it fair yeah. anyway. You can, you can pass it around. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yes. I didn't realize I was looking for this thing. So, you do you still feel hopeful about your practice? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Do you know what choices to make? What industries you want to work with? I mean, if you want to work for a big brand, it's fine, but the fact now is no, no, now, no. No, no, you, no, you know? No, now, yeah, now you know. know. Yeah. You, can, you can make an informed choice, exactly. Yeah. It's your choice, but. Yeah. Whatever you're doing, no, you know. Now you know. Do you think people are going to become more attached to products if they know where it comes from? Because that's the big hypothesis right now. Is if you know where the product oh. comes from, then your attachment grows, therefore you will want to grow uh, Do you believe in that? I, I would say that like, the best way to get attached to a product is to make it. Best way to? To, to, to develop a balance to a product or to yeah. a good object is For to make it. That's exactly what okay. you want to hear for a project. I mean, Can I record you saying that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a very simple thing, but uh, I don't know, like, my scarf has been knitted by my girlfriend, yeah. and I would try to, to keep it all my life, because I, she, she hid it for me for one month, that knitting, and that's the, best, that's the best gift you can make, it's just a scarf, but what it means as an object is more important what, like, what it does, yeah. and, like, even my, uh, like, I don't buy new clothes, but like, it's kind of a fashion show now, <laughs> but... So this, this jacket is like 20 years old. It's like a, the old jacket from USA, worn, worn by workers. And I just like it because I know it's very resistant. And also because I bought it to a friend for 20 pounds. But, <laughs> but it's kind of the object I like because I know the story behind it. And I know it's, it was meant to, to stay as long as it can. And that's, for me, that's most important. You make objects so they last. That's, that's the thing we should aim for, because we want to maximize the resources and the energy that we put into making these products. Jeans, to make a pair of jeans, you need like 600 liters of, of water. So throwing away a jean or making a bad jean is a waste. We should not make a jean so you can consume it fast. You should make a jean so you can repair it and you can keep it all your life. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> 
Um, do you consider yourself as like a niche consumer? Because there's a lot of people that don't think ethically, that don't want to think ethically, and that mm. if forced to are going to be like a company by it. I mean, the way I consume is not to think as a whole. It's just part of a broader of, of a broader thinking that is informed by my practice, by the documentary. It's just the way I consume is not defining uh, the way I, I see the world. It's just showing as a special special moment what I care about, because at the end it's just about that, what you care about. And I don't want my my clothes or my phone to say anything about me. I just want them to last. But obviously, I use them. I also use them as props to, uh, for that. But there is just a question of caring, and uh, rather than consuming, because you have a responsibility while buying something. Yeah. Okay. Hey, um, so you discussed um, user-centered design. Yeah. As well as obviously um, yeah. the impact it has on the environment. Yeah. So where would you sort of put the um, the barrier in terms of what's more important, what would you prioritize? Um, because if something is user centered, perhaps it may not be very environmentally friendly. Yeah. So, where would you sort of put your, um, I don't know what to say. Yeah, okay. Um, what's more moral compass? Yeah. <laughs> so, I think in the issue of, like, if you think of prioritization, you need to think in which scale. And that's why thinking what's the territory in which I'm working is very important. Because if I think of a product like a phone, I know that I will, I will have a mine in Congo, I will have a mine uh, in Indonesia, in South America. I know the impact I will have on that, and I know I will take out trees, and I will open mine pits to do that. I know that it will go through cargo, to maybe like a, a port um, in Kenya to go to Indonesia. Nana. I know all the human and non-human actors that are involved if I want to. And I know how I impact on them through, my, through the object itself. So it's negotiating between you as a human and your need, but be careful with the word need, because it can be very cons mixed with desire. Or, yeah. But what you need is a phone to communicate with a minimum accessibility, with a minimum energy to last as long as you, as you can. But you want that in the prospect of not one, um, uh, say one, no, hurting as little the so environment for that. So we need to negotiate on what do I need and what I need to take out, to, to take away, to toward my uh, toward my object. So it's negotiating on the territory in which the practice is located. And it was for fun, but if you think of intervening, uh, like for example, uh, I'm, I'm from the center of France, in, uh, and my father. Uh, part of a little village in the mountains. It's 1,000 people, and I would do. Uh, I would go with designer there, with students, to look at how this village is depending of energy, uh, energy system, water system, uh, waste evacuation system. I would look at the soil, at the species, at the what are the flooding risks, what are uh, what are the the climate future for this area. So I would design. I will look at that through a multifactorial system, including everything but not only humans. I will look at the species of the involved, depending on the species that we will be using for crops, uh, looking at which kind of species that I would like to foster for what use in case of flooding. It's just like human is part of a system, it should not be central about it. But it's part of the negotiation, but it's not leading the negotiation. In my own opinion, we can be very easily contested. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Thoughts? Oh, is my English okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Are there things that surprised you from the patient? I didn't know France was mostly. Oh, yeah. Power. I was going to say that. Like, yeah, I was. I'm quite surprised that France is mostly nuclear powered. Oh, yes. I just didn't know that before. Seventy percent. Is the uranium like which whatever they get it from? Is that from France? Is it no. Mind of France? Algeria. From where? Algeria. 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 Yeah. 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 Historical connection between France and Algeria. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah.
<laughs> and the fact is, to run a, a nuclear a power plant, you need oil because yeah. the truck that will go into the mine to collect the uh, oil mm -hmm. needs gas. And there is not like, there's not like a long plug from the nuclear power plant to the, to the truck in Algeria. Yeah. So <laughs> even if you want uh, nuclear power, mm -hmm. you still need minimum of oil or vehicles are powered by something else than oil. Right. So it's a very, that's a very tough point system. Does, so does France not have many of its own like coal or natural gas reserves? Is that why? Uh, we use, basically our mix is 70% 70 nuclear, 20% gas, uh, little bit of, of biofuels, of, uh, bio, bio but it's made basically nuclear, gas, very little coal and uh, oil. Maybe it was a strategy that was opened in the 50s uh, after the Second World War, uh -huh. energy independence. Because the concept is, the, um, if you are energy independent, then your economic growth, you, have the, you, are, you can handle your economic growth. Mm -hmm. Like most countries now, uh, economic growth is always depending on energy production. Yeah. So, well not always, but it's a big factor in economic growth. Uh, Germany is basically importing a lot of gas from Russia, so depending on how the supply of gas will go, energy, energy, energy production mm -hmm. in Germany will completely change. This is also turned out of the nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Those are heavily uh, sustaining of coal production. So there is a lot of interconnection when you get energy. But energy it's also the origin of the European, what we now know yeah. the European Union started as an as an association of countries to to address energy. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. But yeah, the electric cars too. Bye bye. What is so good? It's not, not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just think like in USA, if you look at the life cycle of an electric car, uh, an electric car will, pro will emit more carbon than a uh, normal car because most 30% of the electricity that we pour out electric car is coal. So it's like coal, coal yeah. gas. So, but no, the US is kind of taking out coal on the carbon on the energy mix. Mm -hmm. But so far, electric car is still a small but, but you said, didn't you say like if that electric car ran in France, uh, it yeah. would be different? Yeah, because our electricity is nuclear. Yeah. It's just depending on what is the energy that is powering your electric car. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think another car, electric car, is not a solution. So mm -hmm. let's ask Yeah. Or to just get a bike if you have to just go Bye bye. Good? But so, but so the idea is not to just go oh, in yeah. the end. But oh, no, 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 I, I try to open up new horizons for you, which is the most important, is to know what is going on and to adjust and to open new paths for you as designers and not just to enter the industry, think, okay, I will do what, I'm, I, will do what, is, what I need to do. And to be fair, I started my, uh, my work as a designer doing very shitty things. And it's, it's okay to do mistakes. It's okay to know why you don't want to do that. It's okay to learn it for a few years before making the shift. Most people are interviewed through the documentary. Uh, it, uh, it took them like 15 years to be able to say no or to have to align their practice with what they believe. And uh, I mean, I started as a motion graphic designer, so it's a long, it's a, it was a long journey. And I made like a very bad advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just take your time thinking about it and and find uh, and find new ways to think of that. It's most important. Just don't think like okay, so the world is gonna end. And no, it's not about that. It's a fantastic time when we can reinvent the way we organize ourselves. And it's interesting to do it. On that note, I think we should end.